Hello and welcome to this edition of CGTN New Economy Forum. And today we'll talk about computing power and how it empowers China's digital transformation. In the era of digital economy, computing power defines productivity. It has become an important new infrastructure for China. The country has recently announced plans to build new data center clusters in its western region to boost the nation's computing power to support China's digital economy development. To explore China's computing power infrastructure and how it empowers digital transformation, today I'm joined by two distinguished guests. Zhang Yu, Senior Vice President of User Technology, a data processor maker in China. Welcome. And Yu Yang, Associate Professor at the Institute for Interdisciplinary Information Sciences at Tsinghua University. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Professor Yu, let me start with you. According to a recent report on the uh, evaluation of the Global Computing Power Index, China is ranked in the second place right after the United States. How do you interpret that? And what factors do you attribute to China's progress in computing power development? Uh, okay, Xing, many thanks to, uh, for including me into this kind of very important discussion. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm not surprised these two countries rank the top two uh, of the computing power capacities because these two countries are also the top two largest digital economies. Yes. They have the uh, largest uh, uh, size of uh, population of the, uh, of the digital unicorn companies. They have the most active uh, entrepreneurship activities. And uh, 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 these two countries have the largest uh, population of consumers who are demanding for the digital services. Also, if we look at the uh, artificial intelligence research or other research in computer science areas, uh, we, will find this, uh, we will find that the scholars from these two countries contribute to the most part of the studies. All those kind of activities demand for computing power. So my first conclusion is that the demand, the market demand, are the main driven force for the computing power expansion. But on the other side, I, uh, on the other side, I want to uh, uh, emphasize that the, the the role of the investment on the internet infrastructure, like 4G stations. We know that the uh, we know that China has uh, uh, has. Uh, invested a lot on the internet uh, infrastructures, and the computing power can uh, can 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 uh, fuel the digital economy only when we have sufficient capacity of the uh, of the internet infrastructures. So uh, this is another reason why these two countries have very uh, uh, flourished digital economy and uh, why they have a very large size of computing power. Uh, Mr. Zhang, you are in the industry. Help us understand the uh, critical role that computing power plays in China's future economic growth. How important is it to the digital economy? Well, thanks, and my pleasure to be on the show. Co uh, computing power is the foundation and the most important cornerstone of the digital economy. Actually, there won't be a digital economy without computing power. As stated in the United report, for U.S. and China, or any countries whose computing power index score is over 60, if the computing power index grows by one point, we would expect a three times relative growth in GDP. According to another computing power expert uh, report from CAICT, the China, the China Academy of Information and Communication Technology Institute, one RMB, one RMB invested in the computing power building um, will result in three to four RMB in total GDP. So mm -hmm. it is indeed a very important to both digital economy as well as uh, the whole national ec economic growth. Computing power is basically influencing almost all the areas of our life and the economy, from online to offline, from industry to financial, um, from game to education or research and et cetera. So um, it is very important. Mm -hmm. So there's a ratio of one to uh, three or four. Uh, Professor Yu, what is your understanding of this correlation and why there are multiplier effects according to uh, the report released by Tsinghua University? Okay, so uh, let's go back to what happened in the uh, digital economy. Okay, so when we're talking about the computing power fuel the economic growth, we must understand what happened during the last two decades. Actually, uh, we find that the digital economy actually uh, uh, booming because the computing power first 
can support very complex but very important public services. Let's recall what happened uh, in last do in last decade. We have the sharing economy, such as the uh, ride sharing a uh, uh, platform, and we have the uh, uh, search engine economy. We have the uh, social media economy. All those kind of economies are providing the public services. All these kind of public services need very sophisticated computing and rely on a huge amount of data. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first thing is that the, the the information technology revolution enable the algorithm cons uh, uh, algorithm to 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 provide such kind of public services with a low cost. This is the origin of booming of digital economy. This is the first thing I would like to emphasize. And on the other side, in China, there's some special point uh, how the computing power fuel the whole economy because China is a developing economy, uh, not like the U.S. It is a uh, it is a developed country. Yeah. So uh, in, in China, we are not just experiencing the third uh, uh, third industrial revolution. Actually, we are also uh, processing the uh, the 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 industrialization process, the urbanization process, and also the economic transition to uh, more market-based. Market so let's go back to what happened in China. For example, uh, the, the digital economy create a new norm of uh, urbanization. Okay, in conventional urbanization, people move from rural areas to city for work. Nowadays, because the digital economy, uh, uh, people can stay in the rural areas and uh, contribute their labor online. And uh, if we open the uh, TikTok nowadays, we can see many anchors uh, selling the uh, mm -hmm. agricultural uh, goods to cities, but they stay in the rural areas or small towns. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they, they, they stay in rural areas and small towns, but uh, uh, play the role of dealers of selling the good produced from one city to another city. So people do not necessarily to move to the, uh, to the urban, uh, urban, society, uh, urban areas, uh, but can contribute online. Uh, so this is the, the way how this kind of uh, uh, digital economy or computing power contribute to the economic growth uh, mm -hmm. in, in China and in the US. Of course, they have a common track uh, China and the U.S. They all uh, rely on the algorithm algorithms to 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 provide the uh, uh, the the public goods. However, on the other side, China's example is a very unique example, but can 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 show the experience how the digital economy uh, help the developing. Uh, societies to have more opportunities to mm. boom their growth. This is the thing I want to emphasize. Right. Well, we can talk more about that later. And talking about industrial revolution, Mr. Zhang, a quantum computing is believed to be the next highly disruptive technology in computing power. How are China and the United States positioned in this race towards its exponentially higher speeds than today's most powerful supercomputers? Well, quantum computing is to harness the unique properties of quantum mechanics uh, to solve certain types of problems far faster than traditional computers or supercomputers. Given time, it will be the major source of future computing power, I think. However, uh, quantum computing is still in its infancy, and it will still take quite some time for the quantum computing era to come. Quantum technologies are developing very fast, though. Globally, we could see all major countries, including China, are increasing their investments in quantum computing, and the total amount uh, adds up to more than 13 billion U.S. dollars. As to position, uh, we, we do see the U.S. That is taking the lead in terms of paper published or cited, um, and patents filed in quantum computing. But China is ranked second and catching up very fast. At the same time, if you look at the quantum uh, communication area, China is actually leading in terms of paper publishes. So I would be very optimistic that China will be a major contributor or even leader in the areas of quantum information technology. Still, um, a, lot of, a lot of hard work to do though. Do you think that more cooperation is possible between the two countries? Well, um, maybe. Uh, it's, uh, it's hard to say. <laughs> 
Well, we'll see. And Professor Yu, as China becomes one of the leaders in computing power, is there any responsibility or obligation that a country should shoulder? Okay, so I think this is a very good question. Uh, so from one perspective, as uh, uh, Dr. Zhang said, uh, the computing power is a foundation of digital economy. And then nowadays, as we discussed before, digital economy is a very important new opportunities for uh, developing countries or underdeveloping countries to pursuing for uh, growth. So uh, China is the uh, largest developing country who has already uh, explore how to use the computing power to boom the economy. I think the first thing China should shoulder is that figure out and summary, uh, uh, summarize the experience it has uh, of using the digital economy to, uh, to, 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 to reach people, to industrialize their economy, to provide much better public uh, public good and public services. This is the first thing we should uh, uh, we should care about. Mm -hmm. The second thing is about like it because we are the, the the one you know have very large computing power. That means we have a lot of experience about using computing power. For example, we need using we, we many many people just collect the data and using the compute power to provide public good. But on the other side the data security and the privacy issue are, ha, has already suffered us very much. So, ex, so exploring how can we govern the, the economic activities uh, based on computing power is a very important obligation of both China and U.S. And for China as a developing country, we must understand that we have the ob obligation of figuring out uh, a, a new philosophy uh, about regulating the computing power and the economic activities on that. Because for developed countries, okay, they are rich, they are fully industrialized, and um, uh, uh, they have a lot of resource to govern the the digital world. However, for developing countries, they have to, uh, they have to figuring out the how to start uh, their uh, digital economy at first. So uh, we should summarize, in, as, a, as the largest developing country in the world, we should summarize uh, uh, how, how can a country, how can a developing or underdeveloped uh, economy figure out the first step for digital economy growth while protect the basic principles of uh, 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 of the, the, you know, the basic principles of human rights and other things. Mm -hmm. um, what do you mean by human rights? Do you mean the right to development, uh, the right of to... Uh, mm -hmm. As I mentioned, when we're talking about, uh, when we're talking about the human rights, it, 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 it is a very, uh, 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 very broad uh, concept. It includes like the, 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 the right of development, the mm -hmm. right of uh, 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 getting uh, the, uh, the, de the, the development opportunity mm -hmm. and also the privacy issues and other issues. How can we balance that? How can we manage that? That it, especially in a developing country who right. pursue for the development opportunities. That is the obligation for China to summarize the past and the patterns which can be uh, uh, you know, which can be uh, uh, suitable for the developing society. Indeed, well, these issues are very important in the digital economy era. And uh, Mr. Zhang, computing power plays a very critical role in China's economic growth in the digital era. What is your company doing to facilitate the utilization of the power? Yes, issue is focusing on DPU, data processing unit design and development with our own domain specific architecture. Uh, despite being relatively new, DPU is being is becoming one of the, the key processors to make data centers more power efficient and help meet the computing power need of processing even larger larger amount of data. Actually, uh, DPU is a typical milestone of domain specific architecture development. As we all know, processors like CPU have been the main sources of computing power and much of the computing power improvements in processors comes from decades of miniaturization of semi semiconductors, a trend that is called Moore's law. Basically in 1975, 
Intel founder Golden Moore predicted the regularity of the semiconductor miniaturization trend, which doubled the number of transistors on computer chips or processors every two years. That means exponential growth in computing power lasted, lasted for the past uh, few decades. However, unfortunately, Moore's law has been running out of steam as a viable way to grow computing power recently. By um, 2018, it showed a roughly 15-fold gap between Moore's law prediction and current capability in performance. So comes the post Moore's law era. And in this era, processors created with the domain-specific architecture method are more efficient than traditional processors in different domains. And together with CPU, uh, could continuously provide more computing power with much less power consumption. Actually, we have also seen this trend in the popularity of GPU, AI chips, and Bitcoin miner processors. Looking forward, um, DPU will be a key driver to revolutionizing the current computation infrastructure of data centers. It is positioned as the third computational uh, processor together with CPU and GPU in data centers by the industry. Mm -hmm. And Professor, the rise of AI is one of the major drivers of computing power demand. How is computing power shaping the future of AI and how will AI improve computing power in the future? Okay, I, I must just say I'm not a technology expert for artificial intelligence, uh, even though I have some research using the artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, but uh, I'd like to emphasize that uh, according to uh, our uh, research, we have noticed that nowadays the, the, the problem is not just for, uh, you know, the problem for artificial intelligence is not just they do not have sufficient computing power. Actually, uh, some other issues suffered them. So that means paired with computing power, we also need some other digital infrastructures like the, uh, like the infrastructure called uh, trustworthy uh, uh, computing environment. So, for example, we know that, uh, you know, artificial intelligence heavily rely on data, right? right. So, uh, you know, this kind of data can help, the, uh, can help the artificial intelligence figure out the, uh, how, how to recommend good for people, figure out how to organize the transportation system more efficiently. But on the other side, those kind of data also include the sensitive information, including like uh, pro uh, individuals' privacy, business secret, and uh, national security issues. Right. So uh, when we collect the data together and uh, using the computer power to booming the artificial intelligence, uh, we already uh, made a very good job during the last uh, decade. And nowadays, the, the hot topic is how can we, you know, simultaneously enable the artificial intelligence and computing, but also protect the data security. Uh, so. Uh, many uh, computer scientists have focused on, you know, using the cryptographic technologies or other uh, computer science technologies to build up the system to enable the artificial intelligence ways information security. Those kind of system is called, uh, you know, trustworthy uh, uh, computing environment. This is one type of infrastructure, sh digital infrastructure, should be paired with. Uh, uh, the computing power. On the other side, for example, nowadays we have the cloud service, and we should trans uh, we should transport the data very efficiently. So there's other kind of uh, digital infrastructures and services uh, is required for the uh, 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 for the computing power system. So the, the the point I would like to emphasize is, in the next era of artificial intelligence uh, development. The key challenge is not the computing power itself. The key challenge is, can we figure out a way to build up efficient and reliable digital infrastructures can solve the troubles now suffering the artificial intelligence development, like the data privacy issue? Right. And Mr. Zhang, what do you think are the trends setting the future demand of DPUs and what role uh, can you share with us some best practices in protecting data privacy in this sector? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, let's first start from DPU. DPU could, um, could process IO-centric and data-centric tasks very efficiently compared with CPU, such as uh, virtualized network and mm -hmm. virtualized storage, security consumption, and, and 
and etc. Looking forward, it is a must for large amount of data processing data centers. Um, uh, 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 according to the trend, uh, there, there are basically two major trends behind DPU's popularity. First, for the last few years, we've witnessed exponential growth in the amount of data uh, to be processed in the digital economy globally. According to the IDC data, we are expecting 163 zettabytes of data in 2025. And the data growth rate is actually catching up each year especially in the new areas like autonomous driving, like 5G and edge computing, um, the industrial internet, VR, AR, or even metaverse. Mm -hmm. um, combined with the post more error situation, we need DSA processors like DPU or AI chips to largely increase the computing power in different demands, uh, domains to, to process those data efficiently. At the same time, with so much data produced every day, the network bandwidth uh, to move this data around also need to be increased exponentially. These are the IO intense as well as data intense tasks mainly. So DPU is out of its other um, magnitude more efficient than CPU or GPU to process these kind of tasks. So we believe together with CPU, GPU and DPU, we will have a much more balanced yet efficient computing infrastructure. Um, so to the second question, yes, uh, DPU is also very efficient in terms of, um, uh, in areas of in, uh, doing the encryption or decryption mm -hmm. compared with CPU, but still, uh, I, I think these are the basic functions for data privacy, um, but th there are a lot more computation um, that can be done by GPU. Mm -hmm. DPU, yes. Um, Professor Yu, we have seen growing demand of computing power in the manufacturing sector. How will computing power empower China's new industrial upgrading? Okay, so I, I think first of all, we, we, I would like to say, you know, we are in a pro-pandemic uh, 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 era. Mm -hmm. So uh, now when, when we're talking about industry, uh, upgrading industry, we should care, uh, we should be very careful. Uh, you know which direction we would like to upgrade to okay so we know that some very simple industry can be very crucial uh, in, in some in some uh, situation so uh, so this is my first point but uh, the second point I like to say that like computing power play you know or digital economy play a very important role not just to only you know make the industry more autonomous this is one side of that. I'd like to emphasize the digital economy actually reshuffle, you know, the value distribution over the supply chain or the value chain. Mm -hmm. Okay. For example, uh, uh, imagine before the e-commerce platform, uh, we have the factories, we have the consumers. In the middle, we have the dealers with, yes. with yeah with with mm -hmm. brand. So most of the profit are uh, are. Uh, 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 are again by the uh, middle side, by the dealer. However, with the uh, e-commerce platform, we use algorithm to matching multiple uh, buyers with multiple sellers. In this way, the e-commerce platform, you know, you know, decrease or mitigate the market power of the traditional dealers. So this way, they, the the e-commerce or the computing power we mentioned uh, really benefit the industry so make some industry which used to which used to be not so profitable now become very profitable so this is one type of upgradation so mm -hmm. when we're talking the, about the upgradation of the of the industry it's not you, you know it's not a, when we say that i'm not mean you know use one industry to replace another i mean how can we improve the profit opportunity of the industry so uh, generally speaking, the digital economy play a very, very important role to improve the profit opportunity of the uh, industry on the supply side. On the other side, because the, uh, the, 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 the digital economy reduce, uh, reduce uh, the transaction cost, the sellers also benefit from industry more. So when, when you're talking, when, when you ask me how it, uh, you know, change the, 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 the Chinese industry or uh, upgrading the industry, I would like to emphasize, we must uh, you know, notice the effect of how this kind of 
digital economy improving the profit opportunity of the industry rather than just to leave the uh, profit on the middle size, uh, uh, middle side. And uh, uh, on the other side, I want to emphasize the role of government. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, you know, nevertheless, the technology innovation will you know change the economic structure, change the dynamic. How can we how we organize the production, how we organize the trade. But on the other side, the the market failure always uh, you know right. uh, always exists. And uh, now we see in many in, uh, digital uh, uh, industries, uh, uh, the market con uh, market concentration level is really high. Okay, some in some sectors, only one or two very big companies occupy the whole industry. So that means they might have the opportunity. I mean, not necessarily, but might have the uh, opportunity to manipulate the the market, to manipulate the patching uh, matching process. To uh, uh, for high profit, but these kind of things hurt the industry and the consumers, and also hurt the digital economy's competition. So, on the other side, when we're talking about you know how the digital economy upgrade the uh, uh, the, the industry, and uh, I want to say the government should figuring out a correct way to regulate the uh, the digital economy. So uh, you know the, the 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 visible hand can guarantee the invisible hand really uh, ensure the market efficiency. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. John, as a player in the industry, do you think the competition is healthy? And uh, in what other sectors do you see the potential of harnessing computing power? And are there uh, some sort of risks that in your opinion now should be aware of? Um, so um, I I think um, probably regarding to computing power, especially um, I think I do see with some industrial internet and edge computing gradually roll out. I think um, there's also um, related to the network stuff. I think they are posing, um, I think currently the new industries, uh, they're posing top challenges to the network as well as computing power. It's not just about um, having enough computing power. It's also uh, requires the network to be extremely fast uh, with low latency and high throughput. Uh, for for example, the, the industry job control requires less than three milliseconds of end-to-end -end latency, this kind of thing. Uh, this couldn't be done with previous telecommunication network um, you know, which couldn't handle it fast and stable enough, but um, with 5G, it is achievable now. Mm -hmm. So actually, this kind of requirements are the major user scenarios targeted by 5G. So I do see uh, China has the leading position worldwide uh, in in terms of 5G construction and in the network. Uh, so uh, because it, I think China um, at the uh, at the end of uh, 2020. Uh, there have been around seven, around 700,000 5G base stations deployed in China. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, um, meanwhile, in order to meet all these strict requirements, the convergence of computing and net, and networking, and also industry is also taking place, uh, where the computing power will be allocated and transmitted with a holistic view of all, all tasks. This way, computing power and related resources could be consumed more efficiently than before. Uh, I think this is this is also called computing power network, which is also uh, one of the, the, the major projects that uh, China telecommunication providers uh, are pushing hard on. Mm -hmm. um, yes, basically, that's it. And to many of us, computing power is a relatively abstract concept. And Chinese economic planners said computing power has already become an important infrastructure for national economic development. Uh, Professor, you help us understand this. How is computing power similar to the traditional infrastructure, such as the railway? OK, so I think this is a really good question, which also linked with your, pre your previous question to uh, Dr. Zhang. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, as we mentioned that the you know uh, what is infrastructure infrastructure means generally speaking means this kind of good 
uh, uh, can provide public good or uh, you know uh, provide a good not exclusively. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for example, like the electricity, like the the water, like the uh, the the railway and uh, uh, highway. So. Uh, but on the other side, I want to emphasize that the, the, the computing power capacity uh, is a new type of infrastructure. When I say it is a new type of infrastructure, it is from the technical perspective and also the governance perspective or management perspective. From technical perspective, I think Dr. John knows much more than me because uh, the operation of the computing power, the daily operation of the computing power is very complex. And also compared with traditional infrastructures like, uh, like highway or railway, mm -hmm. they, the, 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 they, the, the, the computing power system need the high frequently uh, operation. Okay, so this from this perspective, the, uh, the, the, uh, the computing power uh, system is a little bit like a power grid system because power grid system also need very sophisticated and high frequent operations. Uh, so the the computing power operation, uh, you know, need a lot of technologies, and also ask for we are hiring a lot of engineers to maintain them daily. Okay, those engineers are very expensive, and uh, the government cannot afford for their salaries. We must rely on the uh, market, uh, you know, system to hiring those kind of engineers mm -hmm. to you know operate and manage the uh, computing power system. This is from the technology perspective, the computing power system is unique. Uh, from, the, uh, from the economic and uh, governance perspective, the computing power is also unique. As you mentioned before, uh, you, know, you ask a question whether the competition is healthy. Okay, I think this is a quest very essential question. It, re it, 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 it goes back to the root of how shall we organize the computing power market right. and how should we design the pricing mechanism for computing power uh, you know uh, uh, market so as dr chang just said okay computing power not just uh, related with the quantity but also with quality with multi multi-dimensional uh, issues like the speed reliabilities and other things so when, when so that means the pricing design for or market design for computing power allocation is a very sophisticated question. We cannot only, you know, hands off and leave that kind of pricing system uh, to the market themselves. You know, the, the, the government should hands on the market design for that. This is the first argument. And also, the, the, we, we, you know, we, we noticed that, uh, you know, computing power now uh, um, uh, is mainly invested by private companies. Uh, you know, here I want to quote Professor Zhang Xiaojuan from Tsinghua University. Uh, they said, uh, she said, uh, because control this kind of technologies and, uh, and the infrastructures, these giant companies have a new type of political power. For example, the, uh, the, the computing power companies can deny the services to some particular uh, companies uh, might be because not the economic reason, but also like the political reason. Okay, so in this kind of situation, uh, you know, government should play the role to, uh, uh, to, to, to play the role to decide the rules of the computing uh, power company or operator's behavior. So uh, this is something like the railway, the railway system or a power grid system. If we, if we say the, the, the railway uh, companies or the power grid companies, we will find that uh, uh, the, the, the government have a lot of these kind of regulations limit their uh, behaviors and uh, require them, you know, guarantees a free access principle for the whole society. That means every people, you know, uh, have the, uh, have the right to access to the uh, infrastructure. So uh, this is what I want to emphasize from the economic and uh, 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 political perspective, you know, for the computing power uh, system as an infrastructure. Now we, you know, we do not have sufficient uh, regulations. Yes, we have some regulations, some regulations may not crack. We should really carefully research how should we uh, you know, crack and efficiently regulate the computing power system. And at the same time, we should discuss how should we design the market and the pricing system for this market 
to guarantee they can have a healthy competition. Uh, I want to hear uh, the opinion of Mr. Zhang on this particular issue. Do you agree that uh, more government intervention is needed in the industry, or do you want the market to play a major role? Well, um, I think I am not quite an expert on that, but I think I do think you know. Uh, um, I I do think you know with the competing power. Um, because we computer power will unleash so many um, will unleash so many possibilities mm -hmm. for uh, in, in different industries, especially those new industries like um, like say uh, the most popular metaverse. And then I I do think um, you know um, with this. Um, I think I want to focus, still focus on you know how we want to build computing power because without mm -hmm. computing power, probably um, we couldn't see too much um, progress. And uh, I, I do see there are so many uh, bottlenecks uh, right. regarding in in different data centers. Right. So, uh, yeah, that's a uh, long way to go. Yeah, so, I mean, so John, your company is one of uh, uh, one of the many which are actually involved in building such infrastructure. Could you share with us what kind of infrastructure uh, that you are building and why is it important? Mm -hmm. um, issue is focusing on DPO de development, as I explained uh, previously. DPO will be um, DPO will be the critical processor to handle the I/O intents and data intents tasks efficiently. Um, currently, for large data centers, 25G is the standard ban bandwidth for the network interface for servers in those data centers. Uh, without DPU processing I/O and virtualization at a speed of 25G has already consumed up to like 30 to 40 percent of the CPU's processing power, and with an exponential data growth rate, we are expecting the standard bandwidth in large data centers uh, to be increased from 25G to 100G within the next four or five, five years. When it comes, CPU only won't be able to handle so much data at, a, at such a high speed. So basically, without DPU, all the computing power of CPU will be consumed just by moving data around, packaging and unpackaging data, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, there won't be actual CPU power to actually process the data or, or compete uh, complete algorithms like AI or, uh, for meaning. Thus, uh, it is only with CPU in the near future that our large data centers could continuously serve serve the digital economy well uh, with ex exponentially growing data volume. Um, worldwide, all the major cloud services providers uh, such as Amazon, uh, Microsoft, Alibaba, Tencent, and etc., have also developed, uh, deployed, or been deploying DPO to their data centers. Um, yes. That would be very remarkable growth. And the National East Data and West Computing Project was officially launched recently. Uh, Professor Yu, how will this new project accelerate the development of China's computing power and digital economy? Okay, so uh, before I ask you this, I answer you this quick question, I want to quickly make up my uh, answer for previous question mm -hmm. uh, a little bit. We're talking about the relation between government and the market in this kind of computing power market. It is not a zero-sum game. It not means we have more government, it means we have a smaller market. Actually, if the government can, uh, you know, correctly uh, design the market and regulate the market, the, 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 the market themselves can reach uh, uh, its maximal functionalities. So let's go back to the, 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 your question. It is a, it is a very good example uh, to demonstrate what I uh, mentioned before. Uh, okay, so, you know, uh, before this kind of, uh, you know, East Data, Western Computing Project, uh, the computing power center mainly concentrate on the east coast of China, uh, east region of China, like in, 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 in Beijing or Yangtze Delta region or, uh, or, or big, uh, you know, big Bay Area region. So why? Because, you know, uh, when, when, the, when the digital economy is booming, uh, so many, many uh, 
you know, startup companies need to need to manage them, manage their uh, data center uh, uh, very frequently. So mm -hmm. at that moment, they do not have a cloud uh, market. So they need to uh, locate the uh, their uh, data, their their data center or their ser uh, the, you know server close to the market. So so you know they can manage the data center or the computing power center very you know easily. Mm -hmm. However, when this kind of uh, computing uh, cloud uh, uh, technology occurs, and at the same time we have uh, you know uh, more and more giant companies, and uh, in this situation uh, the, the the market changed. If the government is absent from the market, the data center will still you know concentrate on the eastern region. Because you know, because of the because of the history reason. Okay, now when we now have the uh, you know uh, the 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 data center here. It is a good way you know we just to keep keep them there. Okay. However, uh, uh, however, the, when the government uh, you know began to uh, think about that kind of things, they find there's some opportunity. We rearrange the development opportunity in China. Because nowadays we have the cloud technologies. That means the start small start com uh, startup companies uh, uh, can just uh, you know rent the cloud rather than you know have their own computing power system. So they do not need to have a, a, a computing power system close to them. And on the other side, we have a lot of giant uh, technology companies. They have sufficient capability to build up this kind of big computing power system. Uh, you know, remote from uh, uh, the, the, the market. So on the other hand, on the western region, we have uh, more cooling uh, climate and you know, more renewable energy. Mm -hmm. So lower price for the electricity. So the, the, you know, when, when, so when government enter, when, when government began to think about that kind of things, you know, they, they can find that there are some opportunities. They can help the market to become better, mm -hmm. okay? But on the other side, I want to emphasize uh, that the, the, the thing is not very simple. It is not so simple, okay? Because uh, beyond this kind of energy issue, the, the computing issue, this kind of technology issue, as I mentioned, the computing power as an infrastructure, it is a new type of infrastructure. They rely on a large group of uh, genius engineers for daily operation and management. So the question is, if we move the computing power system or capacity more to the western region, how can we, you know, incentivize these kind of genius engineers to move there, or they just stay there to become part of the uh, the, the economy there? Mm -hmm. So that is another challenge for that kind of things. When we're talking about the eastern data west computing project, it it is not just infrastructure. Uh, 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 investment issue, but uh, it uh, it is not just the technical issue. We also need to pair ways the policies for you know subsidies for engineer uh, for en en engineers to move there, all these kind of uh, policies, so that we can attract more sufficient, not more. We can attract sufficient engineer, uh, uh, you know, move to the to the western region and the. You know, can 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 can. So in this way, the 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 west the the eastern data western computing project can boom uh, can uh, be helpful for China's digital economy. This is my point. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Zhang, from the perspective of the private sector, what potential and opportunity, uh, or even challenges, will the new project uh, unleash? Yes, um, the. Yes, the project will unleash huge opportunities for computing power equipment providers or processor designers like like Yushu. For example, currently there are around five million server racks deployed today in data centers in China, and by the end of 2025, this number will become 18 million. It's more than three times the growth within the next five years. So it is a significant business opportunity for all related companies or startups. Um, at the same time, since many new data centers will be built from scratch in order to achieve carbon neutrality, these new data centers will most likely be equipped with the latest technology and types of equipment 
like DPU and in 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 others. This will greatly boost the new techno technology adaptation rate in data centers and help those companies or startups who have been focusing on tech innovation related to computer power infrastructure. Um, I do see great opportunity and potentials um, for for different kinds of companies, uh, you know, along the, uh, the industry chain. So yes. is government intervention in a good way? Um, uh, I, I think, I, I do think, you know, government is doing a good job, as, as Professor Yi has, has said, you know, um, mm -hmm. it, it is only the government could do, you know, the, the, the holistic um, uh, do the operation or, or planning from uh, yes. So by better utilizing renewable energy in the West, the project plays a key role in lowering the carbon footprint of computing. Uh, what more can be done to cut carbon dioxide emissions? Um, Professor Yu? Okay, so um, this is a very technical uh, question. Uh, so, uh, uh, okay, so uh, of course, from the policy perspective, uh, we can consider involve this kind of computing power uh, 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 business into the carbon trade project which uh, have been launched uh, very recently. Okay, so that so that we can encourage encourage them, uh, you know, uh, encourage the computing power owners use uh, m m more use uh, renewable energy or other low carbon technologies. Uh, on the other side, I want to emphasize that, okay, so we know that renewable energy is intermittent and, uh, you know, unpredictable, uh, not, not, well, not well predictable, okay. So in this situation, that means the, the you know, the computing tasks, uh, those computing tasks who can follow, who can follow the renewable profile, uh, renewable generations profile, uh, they can consume less uh, carbon, and uh, on the other side, uh, the, the 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 computing power, uh, the computing task, which must uh, you know uh, you know require a very steady and the constant computing power, they are more carbon intensive. So from the carbon uh, accounting perspective, we also need to develop some new metrics or new methodologies to evaluate the difference between different type of computing power tasks uh, before we involve the whole uh, business into the carbon trade uh, program. So uh, from the policy perspective, I think we still have a lot of things need to do before we you know, uh, you know, regulate the carbon emission of this industry. But nevertheless, we should do something. All right. And uh, Mr. Zhang, what is your uh, perspective on this? Yeah, I would, fo I would uh, still focus on tech, um, from tech standpoint uh, point mm -hmm. of view. Uh, from the computing efficiency, uh, I, I, for the computing efficiency, I do think, you know, continuously increasing the tech innovation speed and the adaptation rate would help, especially for, you know, um, for the legacy data centers with legacy equipment and network where the PoE, the power usage e effectiveness is not good. I think how to revamp them step by step with a new architecture and equipment would also be important to cut the overall carbon emission. You know, it's not just you know, build new uh, data centers with uh, with the new technology. It's also how we want to uh, balance or 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 revamp the current uh, legacy data centers in the money in the east side. Uh, great insights. Well, we have to leave it there. Thanks to both of you. Uh, Zhang Yu, Senior Vice President of User Technology, a data processor maker in China, and Yu Yang, Associate Professor at the Institute for Interdisciplinary Information Sciences at Tsinghua University in China. So in the digital age, data and computing power have become driving forces of economic growth. As a leading country of computing power, China will further speed up the construction of this new infrastructure and further tap into the immense potential. And that will do it for this edition of CTTN New Economy Forum. I'm Guan Xing. See you next time.